Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our devotion for this morning. Uh, we are looking at this wonderful passage in John chapter 4 of the woman at the well and her encounter with Jesus. And last time we were looking at a, a pattern that we often see uh, that develops between uh, any inquirer and Jesus and how Jesus often just handles the conversation and the pattern that we find in that conversation. And we said that uh, invariably it begins with either Jesus or the inquirer asking a question. And we looked at both Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman and how they did that. And then Jesus usually replies with uh, something that's very difficult to grasp, grasp something difficult to, to you know, uh, to understand. And, uh, and that in turn receives a misunderstanding from the inquirer. Uh, for Nicodemus, you know, he asked, you know, can, can uh, someone be born when they're old? And can they, you know, be born a second time from their mother's womb? You know, almost like a, a rhetorical question in a way, but clearly misunderstanding what Jesus was saying. And in the case of the woman, uh, she says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the will is deep. Where can you get this living water? Thinking that he was talking about something that was physical, something that almost like you could just drink and suddenly become Wonder Woman or whatever. Um, so, but there's actually uh, the, the, that pattern is actually developed a little further than what we mentioned last time, because after that misunderstanding, Jesus answers with a saying that is even more difficult to understand. So in the case of uh, Nicodemus, he answered and said, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. And here Jesus answers the woman, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now, as we said last time, I think if we had heard a reply like that, we would have been as, as mystified as she must have been when she heard Jesus say these things. And so this is the pattern that Jesus always seemed to move along. The final element of most of these encounters is where Jesus gives clarity, explanation, and then, of course, he imparts a new understanding. And those who, who leave, leave enlightened. So let's move to the, the, the actual text now. And let's look at verse 9, and we'll start exploring some of these verses. So verse 9 really just highlights what we were speaking of last time in terms of the enmity that you find between Jews and Samaritans, where the Samaritan woman says to him, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And we are given the explanation as to why she made that comment. And then in verse 10, it can be interpreted in two ways, but let's just read the verse. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. So what is the gift of God to which Jesus refers? Well, the obvious interpretation would be the living water to which he later refers. In other words, the spirit. However, in all rabbinical teaching, the gift of God was always used as an image of the Torah. And in this context, if we would understand it, as that, it would make perfect sense. For Jesus would be saying to the woman and to the Samaritan religion through her, that if only she understood the Torah and the person whom she now asks for, for a drink, it would be she who would rather be asking him for a drink of living water. So then we come to verse 11. And she says, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, 
as did also his sons and livestock. So notice two things. How she calls him, first of all, sir. So she's moved from seeing him just as an ordinary Jew to recognizing him as someone worthy of special respect. And then a perception of him as a prophet that we find in verse 19. And then ultimately to the point of asking, could this be the Messiah in verse 25? So you might remember the story of the man born blind in John 9. And, you know, the, the development in, in uh, his understanding of who Jesus was. And you find a, a progression in seeing who Jesus is. So remember the pattern of inquiry. Inquirer says something, Jesus answers in a saying that's hard to understand. That saying is misunderstood by the inquirer and Jesus replies with something that is even more difficult to understand. And then ultimately Jesus brings clarity and understanding. So Jesus says something that is really difficult to understand and naturally she misunderstands. She misinterprets Jesus' words as referring to the physical rather than the spiritual. The water from the well as opposed to the living water that Jesus is speaking of. In other words, she's ignorant. In her mind, this well has served their people for centuries. I mean, she basically uh, talks about Jacob and it being his well and how his sons and his livestock drank from it and so on. Uh, so Jesus now comes along and says, uh, well, he comes along first of all with nothing to draw with and tells her she can simply get it from living or running water, you know, like a stream. And if there was a stream here, you know, she was probably thinking, do you think I'd come all the way here to draw water? Do you think I'd come to this well in the sweltering heat to draw water if there was a stream? So she completely misunderstands what Jesus is referring to. And then, of course, we have this, this wonderful response of Jesus in verse 13. And he says, everyone who drinks this water <coughs> will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So since the woman is determined to focus on just the water that is in Jacob's well, Jesus continues to talk about it. He doesn't try to correct her. He simply says, woman, the water I'm talking about will make you never thirst again. It will permanently quench your thirst. Every day she had come to draw this water. Every day she ran out of it. The living water Jesus gives is the life of the Spirit, a fountain of living water springing up to eternal life. Not the dead, brack water from the well of religion, Samaritan religion. Now this water is new, it is refreshing, it comes from the Spirit. It is vital, life-giving, powerful. It comes from within. It comes from God himself. And Jesus offers this woman this water. She, like him, is thirsty, but thirsty in a different way. Jesus is thirsty from the journey that he's taken into Samaria. She's thirsty from the journey she's taken through life. But she still hasn't caught on to what Jesus is saying. And Jesus says to her, or rather she says to Jesus in verse 15, Sir, give me this water. And I'm tired of walking to this well anyway. And that's really interesting. That Jesus is not just, you know, speaking about salvation here. He's really trying to create a worshipper out of her. A worshipper of God in spirit and in truth. He's been trying to move her from thinking in physical terms to spiritual terms. But she just isn't catching on. So watch what he does. So after she says, give me a drink of water then. How does Jesus respond to that? He says, go call your husband and come back. Ouch. Why would Jesus strip open a woman's inner life like that? Uh, almost, it almost seems a little harsh, a little callous. Why would he take this one area of her life that has caused her so much shame and pain 
and kind of bring it out into the open for all to see. Because concealed sin keeps us from ever seeing the light of Christ. And that's exactly what Jesus said in John 3 verse 20. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. The quickest way to the heart is through an open wound. And Jesus lays bare that wound and brings it to the point of conviction of sin. And he says, you know, you're right. You've had five husbands and the man you're sleeping with now is not your husband. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Do you get that, friends? Her immediate response is to evade the issue, to go on a digression about the differences between Jewish and Samaritan religions. And how often we do that when someone is, you know, speaking to something that's a little bit just too close for comfort. We try and change the subject. We try and digress. We try and move the focus from ourselves or from whatever it is that we know is wrong in our lives. In other words, what she's really doing is saying, well, let, let's talk religion. You know, this Christianity stuff is scary. Now, let me ask you something. Do you suppose Jesus knew all along that the conversation would eventually come around to this? Of course he did. She brings up the way of worship. But listen to how Jesus responds in verse 21 through to 23. Women, Jesus replied. And that sounds quite abrupt, but it was a very common way of addressing women in those days. Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. So, notice two things in, in these verses of what Jesus says to her. Firstly, the where of worship is not nearly so important as the how of worship. You see, your mountain, my mountain, that's unimportant. The question is whether the Father is being worshipped. Can God be worshipped in vain anywhere? And He can be genuinely worshipped anywhere. And so it's not a question of where, it's how we worship. So God can be worshipped in vain anywhere, and of course He can be worshipped in spirit and in truth anywhere. It's not about the where you actually worship, it's about the how. Are you, in fact, worshipping God? And then secondly, Jesus points out that just as the how is important, and more important than the where, so is the whom of worship. The Samaritans didn't know who or what they were worshipping. And Jesus said salvation was of the Jews. You see, she had no knowledge of God. She didn't understand who God was. She didn't have a personal relationship with God. And friends, that is religion. You can go through the motions of worship, but if you don't know who you're worshipping, it's all in vain. How and whom are crucial, not where. How should we worship? Jesus says, in spirit and in truth. Worshipping in spirit is the opposite of just worshipping in external ways. It's the opposite of empty kind of formalism and traditionalism. Worshipping in truth is the opposite of worship based on an inadequate view of God. Worship must really be from the heart. And so it's a crucial question that comes out of this passage, friends. How do we worship? Do we worship in spirit and in truth? Are we worshipping from our hearts? Have we tasted the living water? Is our worship an expression of the living water that is within us? The blessing that God has poured into our lives. If it's not, then it's a sure sign we are just engaged in religion. For true worship flows out of a, 
a real and a deep relationship that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we'll continue looking at some of these verses um, uh, next time. Um, in fact, we'll move on to something else. Uh, but I'm talking about the verses in John next time. But for now, let's just bow in a moment of prayer. Lord, we just thank you again for this incredible passage. And, and Lord, just what it teaches us about how you approach people and how, how broad your message of salvation is, that it can reach anyone from a Nicodemus to, to a Samaritan woman. And now you call us to worship you in spirit and in truth. And it's not so much where we worship, but how and who we worship. And so we pray, Lord God, that we again, we just look at our own lives and ask ourselves whether we truly worship you for who you are. Whether we, we are, are those who just pay lip service to you or whether our worship is truly from the depths of our hearts for who you are and what you've done in our lives. And so just continue to speak through your word, Lord. May we encounter you in the way those women encountered you. And may we come to experience your love for us in every way. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you. We'll catch up with you soon. Bye for now.